All right, good day, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Little Fuel show. So uh, as the same as the last couple of shows, decided to do some live streaming. That's right, my, my new guest co-host today uh, has some confidence enough to accept the live uh, offer. I don't really offer it to everybody, but I've been challenging more people with it. So hey, in the Facebook world, they like to go live. And in the YouTube world now too, there's a tip. But hey, as we get into tips, let me give you a little skinny about today's guest co-host because we might be chatting a little bit about business, maybe some lifestyle. Definitely going to be uh, mixing some money and finance into it because really, I don't care who you are. You could be a not-for-profit or not, but money talks and BS walks. So anyway, without further ado, we got a chief investment officer at Plan Corp, which manages 4 billion people, billion in investments for their clients. He is also the author of the new book, Making Money Simple, the complete guide to getting your financial house in order and keeping it that way forever. And uh, we're having some fun with that today because I myself have already been going through that restructuring. So anyway, he's built a national reputation as an educator with a unique ability to simply simplify complex issues, which explains, by the way, why Investopedia named him the top 100 most influential advisors. So there you go, people. So without further ado, his name is his website and his brand. Peter Lazaroff, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, Scott. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad thanks to be live streaming. Yeah, it's right. Cool. Accepted the challenge. No hesitation, by the way. Well done, sir. So, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's been something new. I mean, I pay extra for the webinar feature anyway. I just don't always do the podcast live. I'm like, you know what? Let's play around with some more live. Why not? You know? Why not? And I've been running around with my kids all day, so I hope everyone can see how much fun I've been having. Uh, there was no work for me today. No camp, no school. So I uh, had a big family day. So this is a fun way to kind of close it out. Well, let's let's we'll do a partial timestamp on the day of the week. We're actually recording, ladies and gentlemen, on the evening of a Monday. So he just so now a lot of people complain about the cases of the Mondays. So was that a really a, was that actually a complaint or was that actually a sign? no no it was great we had a great day we went uh, to the museum of transportation I have a two year old who's obsessed with trains and all this place has is trains and I have a six year old who's kind of he some of those things like ah oh, been there done that but uh, the two year old just ate it up could not believe what he was seeing the size of some of these things and uh, look having a day with your family in the beautiful summer day is always going to be a lot more fun than sitting in the office. Well, let's, let's pause on that. Do, do you work weekends sometimes then? Do, do you believe in this five days a week lifestyle thing? What so do you what's interesting, I think because my cell phone's in my pocket, I'm working every day. I, unless I'm on my, in July, I try to take a two or three week vacation where I totally unplug. And I feel like for me, that does a lot more than taking a week off here or a four day weekend there because the emails just pile up and you feel compelled to answer. And you know, I, I tend to be a little bit of a warrior so that when I'm away, um, can certain things that I've been pushing forward continue to move forward. But yeah, I definitely will work on weekends if I feel like it's necessary and if I want to. But what's really cool is a lot of the stuff I do is driven by things that just naturally interest me. So if I am working, it's, I'm, I'm not unhappy about it. Um, <laughs> it, it. And I think especially as my now that I have two children, when I had one child and he was younger, he didn't seem to notice if I was around or not. Well, now he's six and he kind of notices. And so I don't work as much on the weekends or I try to work during naps or at night. Uh, but a lot of my work that I'm doing on weekends is reading. And that's, that's just not that big a deal. It's stuff I love doing. So. That's good life balance. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have a library behind me, but my digital library is way bigger. But a, a few of the gurus that I've had on this show actually always kind enough to remind me that you still can't beat uh, the mental benefit of physically turning a page and physically reading a book. So yeah, it's so interesting. So I'm like totally electronic now. And I use the Kindle app because I can read on my cell phone if I'm waiting online or on my laptop or on my iPad. And I thought about we, we moved into a new house in December, I thought about getting a bookshelf kind of making that background and going on to Amazon and buying really beat up used copies of all my favorite books, because I feel <laughs> like I, I should have a trophy chest that is a bookcase. Uh, okay. But I do understand the, the turning the page, you see the progress. Certainly the searchability of notes for me has been a game changer. Uh, but also just being able to read whenever I'm waiting or, you know, have dead time, definitely get, get in my 20 minutes a day at a minimum. Well, so uh, since we're really kind of all of a sudden just jumping right into the whole family lifestyle balance component. So yeah, the reason why I asked about the five day thing is because, you know, back in the day when I was corporate life, I yeah, it was a standard issue, right? Like I think I averaged 60 hour weeks minimum, definitely five days a week. Uh, it was salary. So you didn't actually make any more. 
Uh, and I, and you know, I was young, so I didn't know any better in my twenties. I just assumed that well, every other leader was showing how hard they work. So I just, I wasn't out the way I do today. Like I wouldn't, I literally just got back from mountain biking. So right. yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah, that's life balance back then. No, it was, you work too late and then you go out for a late happy hour. And next thing you know, you're going back and you're tired and you wake up the next day and you put in another really long shift. And it's like, you know, is that really the lifestyle you want to represent for success? And I'm just intrigued on your point of view in this because I learned a long time ago that the quantity of the hours means nothing. That's, that's all showmanship. It's what is the quality of the work you're getting done that amount of time? So, or less. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I definitely worked more hours per week, you know, really slogged through the week at a younger age. And maybe it's because I had the stamina. Maybe it's because I was doing some stuff like getting some certifications on top of my job. And that required me to work more. And now I feel like I work more efficiently. That's the biggest difference. The only reason I feel like I am more tied to my five day, my standard five day work week, even if I'm not here on Fridays, usually I try to work from home, which means that that's a creative time. And you try to take walks and have a slower morning. And that's how it allows me to write and uh, solve harder problems that are facing the, the, the company. But you know, I work at a big enough company where if you're the chief investment officer, people do rely on you. And if the market's open, clients kind of want to be able to find you. And there are some gatekeepers between me and clients sometimes, but also ultimately I want to be working with our clients. That's what actually makes this fun. I spent so much of my early part of my career working with other people that if I just get trapped inside of my research room, well, I'll just go nuts. Mm -hmm. um, but the five day work week, you know, I just, even for our employees, we just want our work to get done. And we want to know that we can get a hold of you during normal business hours. Where you are is not such a big deal. And I think we're trying to be really progressive as a firm. I mean, I'm naturally a younger person in a leadership role. And uh, as I walked into the office tonight to, to shoot the podcast, I saw one of our new hires just leaving. Uh, and it's, I think it's about 718 right now, central time. And I, I started walking out. I was like, oh, well, hey, it's her second week on the job. She was the last person here. Now, I don't know what was happening, but um, you're right. It's not, there's like this part showmanship that you do as a younger person to think that you got to be there when be the first one to be here and the last one to leave. And I did a lot of that. Now it's, look, there's just other stuff going on and you can't do that. And if you start building your days that way, you're just going to run out of gas. It's just yeah. not going to work. It's true. I mean, you just clear physical representations that happen after that or rep they, they literally manifest like uh, excessive cortisol levels. Next thing you're stressed out. Next thing you know, well, for some people they may stress eat. Some people they may not sleep right because they're so stressed out. They're taking the stress into them trying to actually, when they're supposed to be calming down and falling asleep at the end of the night and you're actually still like burning literally the candle at both ends, so to speak at 10 o'clock at night. Cause you just can't wire yourself back down. You can't, embrace that what you just hinted at today like that family connection right like just you know what dude the business will always be there i'm cool like let's unplug for a lead a little bit let's live our life as a family <laughs> it's it's refreshing so just right otherwise what's it all for and i'll tell you i have a really hard time leaving my work behind so if i have a hard day have a hard stressful day if there's something that is just eating at me and i can't quite crack it I have a hard time leaving that at the office, whether it's my home office or our, my office office. Mm -hmm. And um, I downloaded Headspace not that long ago. Some, I, book. Years and years, um, people have been telling me to do it. And it's just all about, I mean, just a med help, uh, meditation aid for your phone. And you, you know, if you can do like a 10 minute, like breathing exercise before you get home, it does help you release a little bit of what is going on. It's, it's, like I said earlier, I am a bit of a worrier. I do get anxious, but, you got to find a way to, when you walk in the door, you know, be present with the kids. And I think that it took me a couple of years. Um, you know, I mentioned my youngest is two. I think it's taken most of his whole life for me to figure out a way to be present on weeknights when I get home and not still have my head trapped in whatever I was doing that day. I'm totally guilty of that. If I get back from a big business trip, I do usually try and keep my travel between Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I always try and if I'm doing home office time, I'm doing on Mondays and Fridays. So that's why like, you know, we're joking around before we started the show today. Like, Oh, it seems like you batch your podcast. I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm not going to just, oh, I, when I first started the show, I didn't have that calendar feature dialed in. I just turned the calendar feature on, plugged it into my website and just let people run willy nilly all over my schedule. <laughs> and I was like, nah, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, there's certain days when I enjoy to record. And then, you know, if emergencies pop up and somebody can't squeeze into the schedule, every once in a while I'm dealing with somebody like in the UK 
or some kind of crazy time zone in Australia, I might have to you know, do one in the morning, but I'm not going to open up that slot regularly on my schedule. I've decided when, you know, what days or what evenings I have guaranteed my wife that, hey, babe, you're normally, she, she has her own veterinary business. So we both are entrepreneurs. So it's like, hey, you've got your business, I've got my business. Let's make sure that even if we don't have any plan, there's like one or two evenings I'm not going to be podcasting. Like, what, what do you want to do? You want to do a date night, movie night, whatever, because we don't have kids. More power to you. Yeah, I want nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> kids are the ultimate efficiency enhancers. You have to figure it out. But I'm with you. You know, I, when I moved to Plan Corp uh, about four and a half years ago, the biggest life changing move I made was time blocking. And nobody can touch my mornings. I mean, I, my mornings are sacred. I put big blocks on my calendar. Um, you know, I say, do not book meetings. And it allows me, and the best thing you can do is just try not to open email. Because you mentioned everybody running wild with their calendar. Mm -hmm. well, I think the other thing that I see a lot of people do is they just become slaves to their inbox. Oh, there's books yeah. written about that. I mean, yeah, yeah, the inbox is everyone else's to-do yeah. list, right? And Every so, lifestyle coach will tell you out there like, oh, I'm your new life coach. Uh, one of my first tips is don't open your email in the morning. And it's like, well, it, but here's the problem. There, there, you got to look at what kind of person you are. Look, you have to really break down your psychology and how you're wired. If that makes you so anxious, then okay, then set aside the first 15 minutes is email time. It just allows you to skim through. If there's no emergencies, you just come back to that stuff later. But then you feel better because you at least took a quick skim through, but you, you respect your calendar, you move on to the next time slot. So that's a great little hack just to kind of meet between both worlds because I learned that one a couple of years ago and I like that idea. It's like, you know what? Let me just take a quick skim. Okay, no, no, no craps hitting the fan. Awesome. I'll come back and deal with this silly stuff later. You know, let's go do some uh, breakfast. Let's go make a nice espresso. Let me go outside. Uh, I, like my thing now for a while now is I'll make a, my vitamin drink in the morning or my coffee in the morning and I'll go out and stand in the grass and just literally, they call it earthing, grounding, whatever you want to call it. I'm just sitting there chilling out, enjoying the sunrise and starting my day. <laughs> I like that. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, so we use the Nutribullet every morning. So you mentioned your vitamin drink Yeah. and I, I swear that type of thing just makes you feel like you've done, you made like one really good decision early in the morning <laughs> and like it just, it can domino from there. And, uh, wait, one other quick question for you. So, uh, I, even though you're the one asking me the question, the, uh, well, you're, the you're the guest co-host. We're asking each other questions. So how do you feel about getting your inbox to zero? Ooh, you know, I actually, it's funny you mentioned to bring that up. I've experimented with that. Uh, three months ago, I decided to do a cycle of that for about two weeks. And then I was like, okay, well, like anything, a habit is really 21 days. So I'm like, let me keep it going. So I did a full month and it actually kind of drove me a little crazy yeah. uh, because I was like, you know what? There's certain emails that I don't want to sort out or I don't want to drop into because next thing you know, I'm like, well, I got to clear the inbox. So let me, let me, call, let me call this a follow-up folder. Well, I'm like, if I could have just left it in the inbox if it was going to be a follow-up folder. <laughs> so, I don't know. Right. It, it's basically the same thing. Well, I mean, I've gotten to inbox zero like less than a handful of times in mm -hmm. my 12-year career. And one of my friends here at work, you know, I was like, oh, man, the email today. I can't believe how big the number is. And she says to me, why don't you just do a delete all? And I go, oh, I know you're kidding. She's like, no, I'm not kidding. Would, would anybody, like, what's the worst that could happen? It got me thinking. And I keep toying with it back and forth. Like, what is the worst that would happen if I hit delete all? I just all? reset yeah. it to you. Like, did you, because uh, like, you could just say, well, spam filter, junk filter. You know, I mean, things happen in the electronic. Well, but like you, I, I leave some stuff in there that I need to respond to. And maybe I don't have the information needed to respond or I'm just thinking it over. Uh, There's no my new goal. I guess, I guess the follow-up on that thread is my new goal is keep it under 100. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't like unread messages. That's, I mean, if it says like... Oh, I, I yeah, everything gets read. Gotta tag those out. Everything yeah. gets read. Everything gets read at least once uh, by the end of the day. Yeah, so, no, I'm with you there. And then I'm literally unsubscribing to stuff all the time just to clean the inbox up. So that's, that's a good best practice once a week. Because I, I, I do crowdfunding. I do all kinds of marketing campaigns. So I'm always opting in, opting out, just to check out people's programs, what they're doing. So there's always times where I'm like, oh, man, I got member to go back and unsubscribe from that. Or I just bought a new product, so now I'm on their email list. I'm like, actually, I don't care about your email. If I want something, I'll go back to your website and get it. So there's those best practices, too, is just cleaning up the junk. Um, yeah. Every retailer yeah. I give, uh, I have an email called Junk Mail Laz. Um, junk, junk Mail what? 
Junk Mail Laz, uh, Peter Lazaroff, Laz, oh, okay. the Junk Mail Laz, and anyone can put, you know, look, you can spam the heck out of me because it's my spam email. Like, you know, if I, if I sign up for something with a retailer or yeah. you give your email out, I always put it there in that way. I, I have no idea what's in that inbox right now. I never open it. The cool thing about, um, so all of the, all of my clients, including myself, even though we have all custom domain, you know, Scott at livethefuel.com or podcast at livethefuel.com, it's, we use actually use Gmail. The whole back end of yeah. our email system is Gmail. So it's funny because when you say inbox, well, I actually have five different inboxes on my phone. I have my personal Gmail. I have my business Gmail. Then I'm a, I'm a, I'm a face of one of my client's companies. So everything I do is on their domain email. So I have an email with them and a calendar with them. I have one of my other clients, I manage his social media. So then he's got a special inbox. He just needed somebody to keep an eye on. Uh, so I manage that inbox. So it's like, yeah, I got a few inboxes. So <laughs> <laughs> inbox zero is not really a thing for you then. No, I mean, well, I look at it from a, okay, depending on the business of each box, uh, one, I keep under 20. Well, um, one I'll keep like my personal one is I'm always keeping out of zero. That one's easy. That one makes me feel yeah. good. My business one, I'm always around 50 because there's stuff I want to keep in there as a follow up. And then my one client, that, that thing is huge. I mean, there's, I'm lucky. I, 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 that's why it's like, you know what? Give it a hundred. I'm fine. That's cool. But to your point though, everything gets read. So that's, I, I can't, I can't stand that. I was like, dude, at least take a peek at it. You know? And then you can flag it for follow-up later. Not unread, not unread. Right. No, no, I'm with you on that one. Uh, I'd much rather spend time reading at night than going through emails. So anything I can do to be efficient, I, I try my yeah. best. Well, since we're talking all about these hacks and these little tips and we're sharing best practices, I say we dive right in to your book because we're talking about books. We're talking about cool. reading. We're sharing all these little other personal hacks. And let me tell you something. Let me just go ahead and start this off. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is making money simple, right? I am the guy who did not make money simple, Peter. Okay. Now my wife is like the perfection of money. So, uh, because her father was a, well, he just, he retired two years ago, but he was a CFO and like high level accountant and, ran three different, five different companies. And yeah, so she was brought up to never have debt, never carry a balance over, uh, has had investments since she was a little girl. <laughs> and then it's like, then it's me. I was not brought up that way at all. Things just got spent a lot. <laughs> uh, so I'm intrigued, like what inspired the book and what is your target audience on people you're trying to help with that book? So I always wanted to write a book I don't know how I got so inspired to actually do it. I know my wife was pregnant with our second child and she was going to bed super early. Um, my then, I guess, four-year-old was going to bed really early. And all of a sudden, I had all this time and I was just sitting around 8 p.m. and just writing. And I would, I think there was one night I sat and wrote 5,000 words. And I go, you know, I think I could actually do this. And so I made an outline and it really, I was just telling the story of how. I built a system just for myself and my family and my clients. And, you know, it's something I do every day. So it was really easy to come out on paper. And when I always thought about writing a book, because investments are somewhat of my expertise, I figured I'd always write an investment book. But this just came out so naturally. And it was really fun and exciting, particularly on the front end. Now I'll admit, editing a book, um, the feedback portion, all the production part is really hard. But the actual I'm stuck in writing, that phase right now. Oh my goodness. I'm finishing my first book and I'm in the editing phase. Oh, well, congratulations. You know, that at least <sighs> means you finished the manuscript. And I think the writing of the manuscript was so much fun. I, I can't wait to do another one. Writing was the easy part because I didn't write it. I voice transcribed it while I was traveling. So well, that's good. I so, like well, that. That's good for completing the manuscript. It's right. not good. Lots of errors. <laughs> it's not good when you move into editing and then you have to go and download those files and it doesn't have any structure to it. So there's no commas, no periods. No, there's no, there's, there's, you literally have to reread everything. And um, a couple of the chapters are so bad that I had to go back and just play in the background while I was reading it through just to hear my voice inflection to see where I was going with it. So I've definitely, I don't know, there's, there's pros and cons to everybody's practices, right? So sure. you actually hand wrote yours or do you write, you type it out? Oh, typed it. And so, I mean, I write for the wall street journal. I write for Forbes. I've been, I started a blog in late 2016, but I've been writing for other people's blogs since I think oh. 20, 2009. So you've been so playing a lot yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot like, you know, if you practice piano or if anything you practice for 10,000 hours, you get there. And I'm pretty sure I've hit my 10,000 10, hours at this point, but 
um, it's, it just comes really easily. And if I do it at the end of the night, typically my writing time is around 8 p.m. So I love to have a glass of bourbon. I don't know. Bourbon seems to get me really wordy. So whether I'm, I'm a scotch guy, bourbon, you're a scotch guy. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I get the big whiskey rock. And I'll turn on the TV. I'll, what, it's usually on sports, and I'm from St. Louis, so it's often if it's Cardinals or Blues season, that's what'll be on. I'm not really watching that detailed, but I just sit down and I write and I unload, and I don't always know what I'm going to write in advance. So I mentioned when I wrote 5,000 words, I said, "Huh, I wonder if I could turn this into a book." And I just kept going, and naturally, that part was really natural to me because I write frequently, but uh, one of my good friends, Roger Whitney, who has a podcast as well, the retirement answer man, he used voice to write his because he is used to talking as opposed to writing. I know a lot of people who take different approaches. I'd say if I had to do it again, though, I would have a copy editor working with me, um, not necessarily a ghostwriter, but someone truly doing like line editing from chapter one. Because by waiting till the end, it's one thing when I write something that's 600 words or 800 words for the Wall Street Journal. It's another when you write something that's 60,000 words that has to all be edited at once. It's a big task. Um, and it was way too, it's way more stressful than it had to be. I'm fairly certain I'll do another one though. So I obviously didn't dislike it. What was that your total much. timeline? I'm sorry? What was your total timeline from start to finish to print? Okay. So I'm going it, to, it's two years, but. Okay. Um, I, I started mine last year. I was hoping to have it uh, printed by spring, but I just, you know, I just had to take a break. <laughs> I had to take some breaks. We built and launched a digital advisor, um, totally separate from Plan Corp, so totally new company. Um, and then around the time when publishers started making offers, I, I was just planning on self-publishing. I didn't really have any illusion of anybody caring that I wrote a book. And once I started getting offers, that slowed down. I completely stopped writing because a couple different publishers had different ideas with what I was doing. And, you know, ultimately I think maybe six months total of actual writing, actual editing production time, but a lot of bits and start breaks in between all those. And I think if I ever, again, if I do it again, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to let it drag out that long. Uh, and the editing process, I mean, the writing process was two or three months. It was the editing and sending yeah. out to people for feedback that took just what's, what's the total words. Uh, so I think I ended up cutting it. It's, uh, I think it's below 55,000. I want to say it's like 54,000. I don't like even think I'm there. I think I'm like 35,000. Um, yeah. you know, I'm doing, I'm doing a self, I'm in the self publishing school cause I don't want the companies telling me what to do. No, it's, uh, I gotta say there's not a lot of benefit using a big publisher. And I knew that going in, I sort of just wanted the stamp. And the next time around, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do something different. And I, nobody really makes money from books. So no. for any of the listeners, you know, unless you're a major, major author selling millions of books, you're not going to make that much money. You, the yeah. amount of effort that you have to put in is definitely not why you're doing it is to there's make money. There's people in my mastermind books. group that say that, you know, you can, once you become a repeat author, like, you know, if you really get, if you really fall in love with the book writing process, then you could yep. over time yep. build that tight, something into a side hustle. That's not why I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book because I want to get back to firefighters because I'm a former firefighter when I left the corporate world. So that's part of the brand. So I'm like, and that book, once I publish it, I'm giving away all the proceeds to charity. So there's no way I'm making money off of that book. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you, I basically gave away any ability to profit in exchange for my, uh, my company to be able to buy just ridiculously cheap books as well as a right to use. So when you go to a publisher, they own your content. Yep. Uh, I, I kind of, my big sticking point was, well, hey, if I want to like put a blog post that's kind of derivative of something I already wrote, like I want to be able to do that. So that was a pretty big sticking point for me as a result. Uh, I would appreciate anybody supporting me by buying the book, except that I'm not making any money. So I'm only doing it. So hopefully you can all learn something. And money is one of those topics where people kind of just fall up and get in the fetal position because there's so many different choices. And a lot of those choices seem complicated. What making money simple does is it really just focuses on a key few issues and helps you build that system for your finances that makes it really easy to make good choices over and over and over again. It's a lot like working out in the sense that progress is very incremental. It's not like you go to the gym once and suddenly you're in shape. You need to go continually. The difference between good money habits and, say, going to the gym is that you can automate a lot of the stuff in the book such that 
It's like going to the gym once for 30 minutes and then having a six pack for the rest of your life. So kind of getting set up and making those good decisions up front and really simplifying it so that you can have this framework that regardless of what your situation ought to be useful. Um, personal finance is highly personal. It's why they call it that. So you're getting but, into a lot of the framework and the foundation here, right? Sure. Sure. So I look at that. So there you can see a uh, table of contents and, you know, ultimately the big concept and the reason I made it chapter one is the power of compounding. And I mix it around in the investment section and then some, this, these first, four chapters are really just building the system. Mm -hmm. The next five chapters are investments. And then the three chapters after that are some big one-time decisions that you have to make, you know, with families, with houses, with insurance, estate planning, hiring a professional, et cetera. But the one thing that is a constant is that time and compounding has the ability to just turn these tiny habits and these small decisions into enormous outcomes. And so Really, you're just trying to focus on the little wins and find a way to repeat those good decisions over and over and over again. And when I started, their automation and finance wasn't as prevalent as it is today, but now there's just an unbelievable amount of resources. And basically, every financial institution allows you to automate anything that they do. Oh, I love automation. I mean, yeah. you were joking around about that with my scheduler on my website. But um, well, actually, real quick on that point of automation and, and building yeah. a system, uh, are you familiar with Michael McCallowitz? Uh, that rings a bell, but I'm missing author where. of profit first. Oh yes. Yes. So I use his system. So, okay. um, it just, that was the first financial system that ever finally clicked for me. And it's kind of based on the old, uh, like grandmother's envelope system, you know, mm -hmm. where like, Hey, you know, well, this is the grocery money. So put it in that envelope. This is your, I don't know, automotive repair, uh, thing. Cause I travel a lot for business and I, and I pretty much love to drive. So I put, over 30,000 miles in my car, sometimes close to 35 to 40,000 a year. So wow. I don't care. I write it all off. But the point is that in the beginning, you know, I wasn't accounting or setting aside like, okay, what if a major automotive repair comes up? You're driving more than the average person. So the whole point was I sat down one of their, they actually have like a profit first, I don't know, counseling group, whatever you want to call it. Advisors at a different level. They're not like official financial advisors like you. They're just teaching uh -huh. you their system. And in, that became a foundation for me and I've loved it for over two years now because, hey, I've got, I've got an account set aside for, for educational, like continued education, going to conferences, books, et cetera. I have an account set aside for any kind of automotive concerns. And here's the thing, if I never spend that, then that money keeps growing and then basically that's the next car. <laughs> yep. You know, so it's, it becomes hard coded. So, yeah, it's really effective. And, and I think that's not all that different from what I talk about. Uh, I, I refer to it as reverse budgeting, where basically um, I have these worksheets. You can download them at wealthworksheets.com and you set these goals and you find out how much you need to save every month to meet all these goals within the next five years. And there's goals for five to 15 years. And Is it different than the ones on your site? Because I'm going to screen share again. Uh, Peter, yeah, so on your resources here. Yeah, so when you go to, uh, just because most people can't spell Lazaroff, I have wealthworksheets.com that will redirect to this page that you're showing oh, now. Oh, well, really? Yeah. That's your site? Wealth Worksheets. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so that way sure you can't that's in the spell. the show notes, so... Um, yeah, wealthworksheets.com, and it will redirect. Uh, you have to put in the URL for it to work. Otherwise, you get all these other people who like my my URL. So go oh, up to the, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. So wealthworksheets.com redirects to my website and the resources. And that very first oh. one, the goal planner, it basically what it does is it helps you kind of establish goals for short term, intermediate term, and long term. And you just figure out what you need to save every month and you create accounts for those. So there's a car account, there's a vacation account, there's a retirement account, there's an emergency fund account, yep. there could be kids accounts and you just, you automatically send the money that way and then you don't have to think about it. Um, Cause traditional budgeting is really, really painful. You have to track expenses every week, every month and most people just won't do it, but you can't spend things that you save. So if you focus on the saving and paying yourself first and you create these specialized accounts, much like you have yourself, it just makes it so much easier. Well, um, I love your cash flow worksheet. Uh, figure out how much cash flow you have available to dedicate towards your goals because the reason why I click so well with Profit First, and it sounds like you kind of teach the same thing here, is that he's really targeting the entrepreneur, you know, the business owner. So admittedly, what you have here is targeting everybody. So you can actually help 
the, the W two person, but sure. Um, you know, for, for hit, the whole reason why his book was re-released a second time because of bestseller uh, is that, you know, the average entrepreneur like I was, I came from the W-2 world. So I, I didn't have a tax account. Uh, okay. Well, that became hard coded because as soon as you skip a couple of uh, quarterly payments and then you wait for the end of the year and your accountant comes back to you and says, dude, you owe thousands of dollars in taxes. You're like, holy crap. Um, I learned that real fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, having a tax account. But the other big thing he teaches you is that, you know, since you're not W2, he said, even if you don't, if you don't have employees, you are your own employee. He's like, so you have to pay yourself. So he's like, so one of the most key things in his system was the owners pay account. Like, are you paying yourself? Yeah. So that's, you know, and it's, I never really thought about it that way, but it's like, yeah, he's like, if you fired all your employees tomorrow, you're still the number one employee. You got to pay yourself. And then, and then another cool thing that he taught us was obviously having the profit first account, meaning you like in the beginning, I hard coded 10%, or sorry, 2% of all gross income went to the profit first account that had to be account in another bank that I couldn't touch. And I didn't have a visa check card except for anything. And then once a quarter, you give yourself a quarterly distribution. You take all that money and you have to go have fun with it. Like, you don't, don't reinvest it in the business. Consider that your bonus. Consider that it's like, Hey, most business owners never get to enjoy their profits. So he's like, that's why you hard code a profit first account is you have to, you have to reward yourself and enjoy the process as you grow your business. And if it's, everything is based on percentages and if you're growing your business, these accounts get more. Yeah, money. they can get pretty big. Right. I, I really like that. And uh, so I'm a business owner, but I'm a business owner at established business. So, you know, we reinvest for growth and we do pay ourselves. Um, and, you know, my own personal brand is its own LLC, but my ownership here is part of an S corp and, um, you know, the, the digital advisors and another, um, uh, another kind of entity. And generally speaking, you know, as entrepreneurs can get lost, in all of it. And it just seems complicated. And so they don't want to deal with it. And that's why you get help. I mean, I feel like I was really fortunate that when I made the transition to being a business owner, I was already using a CPA because he said, look, I won't charge you that much. You're going to be a great client for me because you're going to have all these different business returns, but you're going to need me there when it all happens. And I trusted him. And like you said, the, the, you make those estimated tax payments. You think, oh my goodness, this is, this is really painful to part. And you know, I think that's a lot of the value. And I was doing this before I got here. When I got to Plan Corp, I, I, one of the big values that we had, you know, a lot of investment advisors, it's all roughly the same over a long period of time. You know, people do well, they do well. It's getting really commoditized. You can go get a lot of investment advice online for super cheap. The big thing we do is we just make sure people don't get killed on their taxes. And mm -hmm. you do that through tax projections. You do that through eliminating surprises. I mean, a simple tax projection as a business owner, you might find that you can accelerate income or expenses um, or decelerate, you know, stay below that net, in, uh, net investment income tax and you know, all the planning work that goes into that, you know, that's a big reason to outsource so that you can focus on your business. And I will say that mm, that level of detail is not in the book. You know, I tried to keep it high level simple, but there is a part where you talk about hiring a professional and even I've hired a financial advisor, despite being a CFA and a CFP myself. And you know, my everyday job formally was. Oh, that. I believe in that. I tell people yeah, all the I mean, time, like if you hire a business coach who doesn't have the, his own, his or her own coach, I mean, you're basically telling me that what you think, you know, everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And even let's say you did know everything. It's still nice to have an objective third party there. And um, for someone like my wife who kind of handed me the keys to our finances and she says, well, you do this, you know, you just be in charge. And we have little money dates. We used to have them every quarter but with the kids. Now we probably do it once or twice a year where we kind of go over those worksheets that you find on my website and talk through things. But having a financial advisor, I feel like has given her more of a voice. I always felt like she challenged me, but it feels like now that there's another person there that she can ask questions of, it feels like she's even more talkative. So it's been really important. Plus, it goes, it's I don't take like, care of myself, you know? <laughs> it's almost like a, what do you call it? A relationship counselor or whatever you want to call that. Like you got to have that third party that has mutual respect for you both. You know, it's like, Hey, I'm just here to, to cross the T's, dot the I's and help bring people together and help get everyone on the same page. I'm not here to pick sides, you know? Yep. It, wouldn't, it doesn't even have to be finances, like anything in life. Life's too hard to have to try to figure out everything on your own. And True. I think the sooner you're willing to raise your hand and ask for help and say, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, I don't know everything. I think the better off you're going to be, again, not just finances, but anywhere. 
Oh, I guarantee you. I mean, I haven't even read your book yet. I skimmed over it, but I was like, okay. I, I guess sent a lot of books. There's a lot of authors now. Dear God, you get you launch a ladies and gentlemen, you launch a podcast. You're adding show. to the pile. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you you launch a podcast show. All of a sudden, books start showing up. Like, hey, we're we're sending you a book. We want to see if you can bring them on the show. I'm like, okay, great. Well, okay, I don't hey, read. I don't read the best. Uh, <laughs> but, but my point here is that uh, I was guilty of that. You know, we this isn't just money. It's everything in life. You get this tough guy or tough girl syndrome thing going. You think you know everything. You're going to tough it out and figure it out. The sooner you ask for help, the sooner you show that vulnerability, be willing to embrace it and just get another opinion. It doesn't have to be there. You can get two or three opinions because uh, maybe one of the opinions is really bad. You know, but if all the opinions start averaging out and saying the same thing, okay, at least you're out there asking and you're checking on yourself instead of just living all by yourself in your little cave and thinking that everything is fine. So I support that. And that's where I think your book comes into play too, is like, okay, obviously you're, you know your book's not going to replace a financial advisor, but clearly you wrote the book to at least help people answer some questions. Yeah. I mean, when I wrote the book, I figured someone can definitely do it themselves. It's not rocket science. It's more like mowing your lawn. And you know, I used to mow my lawn at my old house. Uh, part of the reason we bought our house in 2010 was the, the one that we actually chose because it had a big yard. I always wanted a yard. And so I wanted to go mow it. And I'd never mowed the lawn growing up. Uh, my dad always mowed the lawn. And uh, the first time out doing it, it took me about three hours. And eventually I got good at it, or maybe it took me 90 minutes. And I did a fine job. I didn't kill my grass. But the year that I hired somebody to do it professionally was the year my son was born, my first son was born, and I was studying for the final level of my CFA exams. And I remember, oh my gosh, it looks so much better. And it's because they're doing all these things that either I was too lazy to do or forgot to do or didn't even know was something that you would do. Like cutting the grass different lengths depending on its sun exposure or cutting grass in different directions every so cuts or seeding strategically and edging the veggies, the edging, edging the flower beds. And so, yeah. yeah, I didn't kill my grass before, but it looked dramatically different. And yeah. so once they, once you hired that professional, they made it look professional. That's right. And so the book, it gives you everything you need to do to cut your grass. But if you let a professional cut your grass, it's going to be better. And chapter 12 in the book really focuses on that. It not only identifies the value of having an advisor, but also goes through, gives you um, a strategy for interviewing advisors that helps remove some of the behavioral biases that come up. Um, a lot of that, again, is one of, I have some worksheets that support it, but really the book itself goes into greater detail. And it's stuff that was developed by Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, who's a behavioral finance, uh, or he was really not behavioral finance, it's behavioral sciences and decision-making. Hmm. And look, our memories are just bad. And if you interview three different advisors, you're going to ask different questions. You're going to forget what they say. This is a really systematic process to ask the same questions, have objective scoring, and make a decision that you can look back and understand why. The biggest mistake people make when they hire an advisor, they just don't spend that much time doing it. I mean, it's a huge investment to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Why not put some time into it? So you're saying people rush the hiring? Yeah, and I don't think they really review their options enough. Um, I think you get a referral and you just take it and run instead of asking people the hard questions. Well, I mean, you know what? This happened to us last year, picking out a, uh, somebody to, to put a brand new uh, concrete patio in behind our house. You know, it was like, Oh, well, so-and-so does it and he works on my property and he's an amazing lawnmower guy. Well, just because you're an amazing lawnmower guy doesn't mean you know how to pour a freaking patio. So we're, we're, well, we're, we're still in the courts in regarding a lawsuit. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so there you go. Maybe spend a little more time making sure that their business name is actually reinforced with actual skills because they call themselves educated landscaping. And there was nothing educated about it. I'll just say that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, enough said on that. The point is, I love that point. Like, guys, like, this is your money. Like, maybe dig a little deeper. You know, maybe interview three or four different advisors. You know, go with the one you feel most comfortable with. What's the what's right. the pedigree? What's their portfolio? I don't know. What what other stuff gets asked about? Well, how else would you expect people somebody to dig deeper into that? So uh, some of the things that I lay out on the website is, or excuse me, on the website. Well, I do it on the website, but in the book is you look for someone with the right background and education. So you're looking for somebody with, who's a CFP, a certified financial planner, or a CPA, or a CFA who's a chartered financial analyst. Those are kind of the three, in my mind, gold standard certifications for giving financial advice. 
you definitely want them to be a fiduciary at all times. And so people in my industry are obsessing over something right now in the news, but the SEC put out this fiduciary law. And you have brokers and you have people who are actual advisors. Hmm. And then even worse, you have some people who wear different hats at different times. So you don't know when it's actually in your best interest. And so what you want to do is find someone who will, in writing, say at all times, no matter what, they'll act as a fiduciary, which means they'll put your interests before their own. So when you go to the doctor, you don't like wonder if they're prescribing you medicine because of the kickbacks you're getting. You just know that the doctor's trying to make you well. Well, and, I'm, I'm going to argue that one. <laughs> well, you, that's, a whole, that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> I come from parents of doctors, so maybe I'm, I'm biased. Uh, but also, I mean- You probably have great parents, I mean, but- Generally, you go to a professional, you ex- or you, know, you go to an attorney, or well, they can, same, I can see where you can make the same argument, but- Generally, if you go to someone, you should trust that the advice is not in anyone's interest, but making your financial life better. And there are so many different titles out there and designations and words that just confuse people. And you you might ask somebody, are you a fiduciary? And they say, yeah, of course, we always ask, act in your best interest. Like, well, so are you a fiduciary? Yes, we ask in your best interest. You know, will you put it in writing? Well, you know, compliance might not be okay with that. So Really clearly got to. Why would compliance not be okay with that? Well, because people who are claiming to be fiduciaries aren't actually fiduciaries. And so you've got half these people um, in the workforce who are saying, you know, throwing away, throwing around the word fiduciary uh, like it means nothing. And so do you have to be certified at a certain level to qualify to be a fiduciary? So really what it requires is that you're regulated by the SEC. Um, Brokers, people at the big wirehouses, they're self-regulated by a different body. And so SEC registered firms are people who are fiduciaries all the time. Now, there are some people who are duly registered, but let me make it real clear what the difference is. You go to the Toyota dealer, you start describing what would be, um, you know, a Toyota Tundra, and you start giving all the, the... the details. Oh, I kind of got my story background. Let's say we go to a Ford dealer. We're, we're describing a Toyota Tundra. Oh. And the, dealer, the dealer who's not a fiduciary says, well, it sounds like you need an F-150. They're right over here. Whereas the fiduciary would have to say, actually, it sounds like you need a Toyota. That place is down the street. You should go down there. And they lose the sale. Mm-hmm. And so all that people have to do when they're not fiduciaries is it has to be suitable. It has to be roughly like what you need. And that standard is really important. Um, I have a lot of resources on my website dedicated just to that one topic because it's a small distinction, but it's an incredibly important one. And why wouldn't you want to work with somebody who by law is required to put your interests first? Oh, I, I respect all that stuff because I, I'm not, I was not at that level, but I had gotten, I tried, I thought I was going to enjoy getting into the finance world. I studied, got my series six and 63 and so I was dealing with small business retirement, uh, working with uh, the big ADP corporation. Okay. And I don't know if this is still true, but when I was there, uh, when all of the, all the world's finance went to crap, including our own country, ADP was still the only triple A certified uh, company financially, which was, I guess, cool, but also like, man, that's sad. Like our country was no longer triple A rated anymore because of our debts to China. That's right. You know, well, like, wow. ADP like the paycheck people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah they had a whole retirement division. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah, that I remember them being one of the last survivors, and maybe Microsoft as well as triple A. And yeah, it, it was a weird time. Crazy it was, time. but I mean, I, I the, le- the level of study. I t- I set the whole month. I stay, they paid me to sit in a conference room and just study to get my licenses. It was awesome. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm coming to work to to study. I'm like, okay. I never liked studying. I like learning, but I didn't like studying. So. No, and I didn't like finance after that. So either I did it for a year. You figured it out. That was good. You know what? I did it for a year. I took advantage of some of the tuition reimbursements to help pay. I went back to school on nights and weekends as an adult, did some marketing and psychology and finished the BS and then left for an adventure to go fight wildfires with the federal government and then came back and became an entrepreneur. So there's a fast forward story. Uh, but, so it's like, listen, I tell people time, like, you know, you think you're going to like something you don't move on. And uh, my old boss, I even told him like, listen, I need you to terminate me. And she's like, you're number two in sales. I can't terminate you. I'm like, yeah, you can. And she's like, yeah, but it's going to affect your licenses. I said, yeah, I just want the unemployment for 60 days while I move out West to go fight fires. And she just looked at me and she's like, Scott, you're crazy, man. But all right, whatever. <laughs> she's like, I'll fire you. I'm like, thank you. I literally <laughs> negotiated my own termination just to have that 60, 90 day buffer to help me cover moving costs. 
I had never used unemployment before that. So I was like, Hey man, I worked my ass off. I might as well take advantage of it. So you pay taxes. So, you know, you're, you were, now you're paying it back, right? Oh yeah. There you go. I still pay a lot of taxes. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, so so some people are meant to be in finance like you, other people like me, I'm like, nah, I'd rather pay professionals like you to take care of that for me. So uh, I, I, I totally respect the power of outsourcing. I'm currently interviewing new VAs right now because I want to hire a new VA to take over a good chunk of this podcast because the podcast doesn't make me money. This is fun. Um, I help grow people's brands and their exposure and everything else, but I purposely don't bring on advertisers because I can't stand advertisers and commercials on a podcast. It drives me crazy. So I was like, there's no way I'm going to do that. I self fund everything. So it's like, all right, I need, I need to have somebody doing the blog stuff again. I used to have that for a little while. I'm like, I took it back over. I'm like, nah, I need to get a VA, get them trained up, do the blogging, do the show notes, get all that covered. Uh, you know, those just the, the little things. Uh, but we, we, over a year ago, I hired a cleaning lady. Holy crap. That is amazing. And yep. my wife and I don't, didn't want to clean the bathroom or the kitchen. Like I'm actually, I'm actually very clean. So I'm always cleaning up after us anyway, but having just once a month, we're actually pretty minimal. Just once a month. It's two of us and a dog. That house I come home from a business trip. It is just dialed in. (laughs) It's the best. It's It's like one of those expenses that once we added, if we had to like cut back on stuff, I feel like it's probably the last thing we would touch. Especially you guys. I mean, it's like with kids and everything else, like, Uh, yeah. Like okay, my, mostly you just have to pick up. I mean, I think every night after dinner, I take a little Swiffer under the table. So you you mentioned no one wanted to clean the kitchen or bathrooms. I feel like I constantly am cleaning the kitchen. I don't I'm know always cleaning the kitchen. I'm with you on that. I am always like, cleaning the kitchen because I cook. So. Yeah. Well, and I don't cook as much as I used to, but even then I just, I don't like a dirty kitchen. No, same way. Yeah. I'm always wiping it down. Like I, but, I can just walk by, fill up a glass of water and just give a quick wipe down. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can trust that one of my kids left like a bowl by the sink or, you know, food on the ground. And so there's always something to clean up at the moment. Um, I oh, you said you have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Two-year-old. Yeah, yeah so, that's like, totally we possible. The cleaning people come through and the big thing is getting everything picked up before they come. Yeah. How about that? Like you're paying to have a cleaning person and we literally clean before the cleaning person comes. That's right. That's right. Well, that's what I used to say when I was younger and a, I remember my mom getting really mad at me, but uh, now I get it because if we paid the cleaning people to both pick up and actually clean and make the house not like dirty, I think they'd be there for an entire day. We can't afford that. Yeah. So uh, they're they're as it is, these people come here for like two to three hours. I don't understand how they're making enough money. Uh, But I'm like, I don't care. I appreciate the rate. And you want to sit here for two, three hours, clean my house. You go ahead and do that. There's a lot of research that shows uh, purchases that create time like that are things that directly correlate to happiness. There's a a handful of things that you spend your money on that actually make a difference on your happiness and experience is one and spending on purchases that create time and gifting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another one, but you know, those are all things. And actually I do touch a lot on this in the book and I just think it's so important to, you know, I, as obsessed as I can get about saving stuff is to understand where to put the money to get the biggest bang for your buck. And man, that, that cleaning service and same with our lawn. Like, I don't really feel like mowing the lawn anymore. Like I'm just done with it. Uh, I could care less. I'm already done with it. I grew up having to mow over five acres of lawn on, on my farm. Oh yeah. So, and then I move in here and my wife's like, Hey, I, she, her, her, her brother does very well financially. So he hired a land, landscaping service. So he had like a brand new, beautiful lawnmower and he just gave it to us. So she's like, hey, look, you can mow the lawn faster. I'm like, I don't want to mow it at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm already ready to outsource it. So I, I'm, I'm still doing it. We don't have that huge of a lawn, but we're looking at a new place in the next year or two. And then this, house, this property will get flipped into a full rental. Uh, so this will be our first official move into the real estate investment. And I was like, yeah, as soon as that happens, I'm hiring a lawn service to take care of both properties. There you I'm, go. And uh, that'll go under the operational costs of property and management. So I feel like if I had a ride mower, I might have enjoyed it more. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it at first because it was like one of those tasks that there's not a lot of tasks that you can sit and completely finish. And, you know, that thing on your to-do list that just like starts and finish all at one time, like no interruption. So I liked that component of it. But I also just, you know, just got tired of it. But I think my neighbor at my old house had a ride mower. I kept, he, it looked like fun. Like he'd do laps around his house at the end, like he's driving it like a race car. And I'm like, yeah, I could maybe get into that. But uh, we that ultimately hired somebody before I went down that, went down that road. Well, I just love how we're kind of ending, ending on, a, on a fun note because 
I think big picture, this kind of circles back to your book and why I was looking forward to chat with you today because we are at the end of the show here is that, you know, this is why you need to make money simple so you can reward yourself and say, wait a minute, how much time am I spent cleaning the house? What is it worth to have my wife and I come home and have a fresh house like once a month? And then all you got to do is just, you know, maintain between. Same thing with like the podcast stuff I'm about to outsource. Same thing with uh, the lawn stuff. It's like, dude, what is your, what would you rather be doing? I'd rather be mountain biking than, than mowing my lawn. <laughs> yeah. So no, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. Well, look, if, uh, if, if the listeners out there, whether you're entrepreneurs or salaried, if you're trying to figure out like, well, how can you get this a little further? Um, I did when I wrote, wrote the book, create an assessment that kind of nine questions tells you three, four areas to focus on right now where you can maybe make some improvements to get to this happy place. It's a smartmoneyquiz.com. Oh, uh, does that go somewhere on this site too? Or is that a whole different site? Uh, it is a different site. It points you towards resources here, but yeah, I have to deal with the fact that Lazaroff is not uh, that easy to spell. So you can tell I'm into these multiple URLs. DNC gets you to plazaroff.com that outgrow, you know, outgrows the service I use to, there you go. Uh, to hold on the quiz. But it's nine questions, real easy, points to where to go um, you know, if you're not sure on what is the hole within your plan. And so uh, go ahead and check that out. It's designed yeah. to be easy to use, just like the book. And uh, hopefully you can buy a, ride, buy a ride mower and drive it all around your house and not actually mow the lawn. <laughs> we have a very large riding mower. It's actually too big for our lawn because he, like, he had like three acres and he, he bought the biggest one he can get. I'm like, all right, I'll just stick it in the garage. We'll use it for the next property. So, uh, well, so listen, Peter, I always have my guest co-hosts help close the show out with some final words. So thanks for sharing the assessment. We're definitely going to get that. Uh, actually, Lauren, what was the original URL again? Because it already rerouted. That's right. Smartmoneyquiz.com. There we go. I'll make sure that goes in the show notes. All right. So that aside, is there any final words, all encompassing message you want to want to sum up? Like, I don't know the book, obviously it's a legacy. What do you, what's, what's the big message you're trying to put out there? People are trying to uh, figure out Peter. Uh, yeah. Well, on the finance side, uh, I think a lot of people just want to make sure they're doing the right thing. And money can seem complicated, but it just doesn't have to be. Life is very complicated, and you're trying to find ways to simplify it. Don't let it be something that you put to the side because it seems complicated. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great resources out there, not just my own, that are helping simplify it. The internet has done wonderful things. Podcasts like this have done wonderful things in making these issues more approachable. Uh, and so I really encourage you to try to, if there's something you've been putting off your finances, whatever it is, that one thing, you can probably think of it, go ahead and just do that. Take care of it now because the benefit from it will compound over time. And, and that's something that if you don't do, you just can't replace missed time on that front. I love that message. Cause I've always, I always try and share that time is, is it's definitely the one thing that we need to value more and understand that's not replaceable. So that's a good, yeah. powerful message. I like that a lot. That's some good final words. Thank you. All, All right. right. Thanks, Scott. Well, listen, Peter, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, again, he himself says that his name is a struggle, but I don't think so. It's <laughs> PeterLazaroff.com, a single Z, double F. That's all you got. But hey, uh, check out the book. Obviously, we already shared it multiple times during the show. Again, Making Money Simple. It's on Amazon. You can just go to his, his site. It'll click through. Uh, and then I check out that free assessment, smart money quiz. All right, we'll check that out as well. We'll make sure it's in the show notes. So again, ladies and gentlemen, that's PeterLazaroff.com. Thanks for tuning in to another Live the Fuel show. We're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. And today we tossed a little finance in on top of all of it. So thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you guys again soon.